16 years old and graduated in 2004 with a BA in political science. He graduated Harvard Law School in June 2007. Ben was hired by Creator Syndicate at age 17 to become the youngest nationally syndicated columnist in the U.S. Ben is the author of the national bestsellers, Brainwashed, How Universities Indoctrinate America's Youth, Porn Generation, How Social Liberalism is Corrupting Our Future, and Project President, Bad Hair and Botox on the Road to the White House. His latest book is titled Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America. He has appeared on hundreds of radio and TV shows around the nation, including Fox and Friends, The O'Reilly Factor, The Glenn Beck Show, among many others. My personal favorite appearance is when he took on CNN's Pierce Morgan on gun control following the Sandy Hook tragedy and gave him a much-needed copy of the U.S. Constitution. We need more advocates in the conservative movement who are willing to be on the offensive in interviews, and Ben does exactly that. Ben is married and currently run, runs Benjamin Shapiro Legal Consulting based in Los Angeles. He is editor-at-large at Breitbart.com and Shulman Fellow at the Freedom Center. So first we're going to show a clip of the interview that I was just speaking about um, when Ben Shapiro took on at CNN's Pierce Morgan. Um, it's about a minute and a half. Has strong words for me. He says, I'm off the rails on guns in America. Ben Shapiro is editor-at-large at Breitbart.com and the author of Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America. So why am I off the rails, Mr. Shapiro? Uh, you know, honestly, Pierce, you've kind of been a bully on this issue because what you do, and I've seen it repeatedly on your show, I watch your show, um, and I've seen it repeatedly, what you tend to do is you tend to demonize people who differ from you politically by standing on the graves of the children of Sandy Hook, saying they don't seem to care enough about the dead kids. If they cared more about the dead kids, they would agree with you on policy. I think we can have a rational political conversation about balancing rights and risks and rewards of all of these different policies, but I don't think that what we need to do is demonize people on the other side as, as being unfeeling about, the, about what happened in How Sandy How dare you accuse me of standing on the graves of the children that died there? How dare you? I've seen you do it repeatedly, Pierce. Like I say, how dare you? Well, I mean, you can keep saying that, but you've done it repeatedly. What you do, and I've seen you do it on, on the program, is you keep saying to folks that if they disagree with you politically, then somehow this is a violation of, of what happened in Sandy Hook. And you have yet, I, I, I'd really like to hear your policy prescriptions for what we should do about guns. Because oh, you say that you respect the Second Amendment, and you yeah. know, I brought this here for you so that you can read it. It's the Constitution. And I, I would really like for you to explain to me what you would do about guns that would have prevented what happened in Sandy Hook. If you want to do what you did in the UK, right, which is ban virtually all guns, that is at least a fair argument. And we can have a discussion about whether that's something that we ought to do well, or I've not. Made it very okay, that definitely deserves a round of applause. Um, the interview goes on for, I think, about 14 minutes or, or so, so definitely YouTube it, watch the whole thing. It's definitely worth watching. Um, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ben Shapiro. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure. This is the first time I've been out to uh, the Reagan Ranch and the first time that I've done a specifically YAF event. I've been a huge fan of YAF for a long time, especially because it gives me the opportunity to be one of the older people in the room, which very rarely happens. Usually I'm speaking to a group of 70-year-old women. Let's start off with um, why Mitt Romney lost this past election. Um, there are a lot of reasons that have been given as to why Mitt Romney was defeated by Barack Obama, despite the fact that Barack Obama is not a good president. Virtually no one thinks that Barack Obama is a very good president. The economy under him has been terrible. His foreign policy has been pusillanimous, which means it's been spineless. Um, and uh, he has not been a success on virtually any front, and yet he won, and he didn't just win. He won a pretty overwhelming victory in terms of the voting population. So the question becomes why he won. There have been a bunch of reasons given, right? You've heard that our technology was bad. That's true. Our technology was bad. You've heard that we spent too much money on 30,000-foot advertising campaigns, and they spent all of their money on grassroots door knocking. That is also true. The real reason, though, why we lost this election and why we continue to lose elections, it's not because the Democrats know what they're doing. It's not because liberals know what they're doing. They don't. I mean, we live in the state of California. I live in the state of California. I can promise you they have no clue what they're doing. <laughs> the real reason that Barack Obama won is very simple. Imagine that you are a voter who doesn't know much about politics. 
right? You just walk into that voting booth, and all you know about the candidates is what the opposing candidate said about them. All you know about Barack Obama is what Mitt Romney said about him, and all you know about Mitt Romney is what Barack Obama said about him. Both candidates actually define their opposition. So here is what you heard about Barack Obama from Mitt Romney. Nice guy, good family man, believes in the Constitution, believes in the Declaration of Independence, not particularly good at being president. Good guy, bad president. Here's what you heard about Mitt Romney from Barack Obama's camp. Worst guy since Mussolini. Mitt Romney is the kind of guy who wants to strap dogs to the top of cars. Mitt Romney is the kind of guy who has binders full of women because he hates women. Mitt Romney is the kind of guy who wants to put y'all back in chains. Mitt Romney is the type of fellow who would specifically fire an employee so that six years later his wife would die of cancer. This is who Mitt Romney is. He's a greedy bastard who is going to take all of his money and store it overseas so that the federal government couldn't tax it for the broad welfare of the American people. This is who Mitt Romney was. So you have a choice as a voter. Good guy, bad president, or Mussolini. You're probably going to choose good guy, bad president. And this is the tactic that we see over and over and over in politics. I'm sure that you've all experienced it in your high schools. When you go and have a political discussion or debate with somebody, it's pretty quick that somebody says that you are a bad person. They call you mean or they call you intolerant. They call you a bigot. They call you ignorant. It's, it's not long before some issue comes up where they can label you the bad guy. Every political discussion is a story. Every political discussion is a narrative. And the left, they, they are experts, experts in portraying you as the black hat, as the bad guy in that narrative. right? And, and this is the most important part of any narrative. I mean, imagine, you know, I have a friend who's a, a producer in Hollywood, and he likes to, he likes to talk about Star Wars a lot. In Star Wars, the, the thing that matters in Star Wars is actually defining the opposition. Right? Luke Skywalker is one of the most boring characters in all of cinema. He's supremely boring. He doesn't do anything. Right? There's nothing special about Luke Skywalker. He's just on a planet being a bratty teenager, and then he has a lightsaber. That's Luke Skywalker's story. <laughs> hey, the reason that you like Luke Skywalker is because you hate Darth Vader. Star Wars does not open with Luke Skywalker. Star Wars opens with the ship being taken up into the Empire ship, and then they weld open the door, and a seven-foot-tall monster walks in with a skeleton for a face. A bunch of stormtroopers walk in with him, and you know how you can really tell he's a bad guy? Well, because he picks a dude up by his throat and proceeds to strangle him, right, in the first five seconds of the film. It doesn't matter who you cut to next. That guy's going to be the hero, right? This is how politics works, too. All politics is narrative, and the left has its narrative, which is that you're a bad person. Every political argument comes down to you're a bad person from the left. Every one. They don't have a playbook. They have a play. Right? You, can look at, you can look at any issue that we're talking about right now. Yesterday, Joe Biden on immigration reform, he said that opponents of immigration reform, this particular bill, were mean. Right? This was his actual argument. His argument is that you are mean. He said it was unchristian to oppose the immigration reform bill. I'm not even a Christian. I know that's bull. <laughs> the fact is that... The left's argument is a bullying argument. This is a bully tactic. They are making, we are making political arguments about facts and figures, and they are making character arguments about how you're a nasty human being. And that means that you have to go right back at them. So I'm going to give ten rules here for debating folks on the left, for discussing issues with folks on the left. Before I start that, one quick question has to be answered. Why bother discussing things with people on the left at all? This is a very real question. People always laugh when I say that, but it's a very real question. Why do you bother with the conversation? I see so many people, you know, kids, adults, it's usually people who are like my parents' age, spend a lot of time on Facebook discussing politics with their friends. It's a complete waste of time. And I always tell them, you know, when you're on that deathbed and you're staring at that, at that mahogany box and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I really wish I had that 11 hours I spent arguing with Aunt Ida back. That's when you probably should have not spent the time with Aunt Ida. So don't spend time talking with people who are not convincible. There are only really a couple reasons to talk with people who are on the left. One is to be polite if they're serving you food. Okay. <laughs> the second is if they are actually convincible. You found the one honest leftist who actually has an open mind and is not just saying they're open-minded in order to use it as a baton to beat you for being closed-minded. They actually are open-minded. right? If you're talking with an open-minded person then you can have an honest political conversation. And the third reason to discuss an issue with somebody on the left is in a situation like, like with peers, which is there's an audience, and if, if there is an audience and the person's closed-minded, then your job is to beat them bloody. Your job is to take them down and humiliate them in front of as many people as humanly possible. Okay, so with that in mind, <laughs> here are the ten basic rules 
for dealing with folks on the left that you have to debate. The first one is you can't get intimidated. It's very intimidating in most of these circumstances. Usually the crowd is not on your side. Usually people are going to think that you're you know, being aggressive. Usually you're going to get criticized for being mean. I can promise you that in politics, as in football, nice guys finish last. It's actually a baseball, Leo DeRoche is saying, but it, it, nice guys finish last. The bottom line is that you know, if, you are, if you're going into an interview and your general outlook on the person interviewing you is this is an honest person, that's probably not true. You see this happen with Republicans all the time. Republicans go on with people like George Stephanopoulos, and they treat him as though he's an objective journalist. That's a huge mistake, because George Stephanopoulos of ABC News hides behind that facade of objective journalism in order to push a leftist agenda. It's idiotic that Republicans have debates moderated by people like George Stephanopoulos. He's a leftist. He was in the Clinton War Room. There's a, there's a movie called War Room. It's, it's with George Stephanopoulos in the Clinton War Room. And, and now he's considered an objective journalist for ABC News. That's stupidity. When you go on, your first goal is to, is to take that person down. And it, it's just like a sports game. You have to watch the tape. I mean, I, I, the reason that I did that with Piers is because I have seen his show. I knew what he was saying. And I knew that he had no good comeback to it, which is why you see him clutching his pearls and shouting, how dare you? Right? Because he, he, doesn't ha he didn't have any sort of good comeback to that. And the fact that, the fact that he's British just makes it that much more delicious. Um, <laughs> So first of all, don't get intimidated. It's too easy to be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Now, in the classroom, when you're talking with the teacher, be smart about it. I always said this. I was at UCLA. I graduated summa cum laude from UCLA. There's a reason I graduated summa cum laude from UCLA, being a conservative. That's because when I was in the classroom, I'd mouth off. And when it came time to write in my blue books, I wrote like a commie. Right? This is what you should actually do. Okay? Don't sacrifice your grades in order, to, in order to make a point, because I promise you no one is going to get the point. All they're going to see is your transcript. So make, uh, so, you know, convince people outside the classroom. You can work inside the classroom. When it comes time for the test, get good grades because you can wield that Harvard Law degree much better if you're actually in Harvard Law as opposed to at CSUN. Um, if you, so, so, number one, don't get intimidated. Number two, you have to frame your opposition. You see, this is exactly what I was doing with peers. There are only two things that I knew I was going to do before that interview with peers. They both happened in that little clip. The first one is I knew before I started I was going to accuse him of standing on the graves of the kids of Sandy Hook to push his political agenda, because that's exactly what he was doing. Now, that wasn't me calling him mean or nasty or a jerk. It wasn't name-calling. It really was not. It was, in a, it was exposing his tactic, right? That was the tactic that he was using. That's why he couldn't run from it. And in fact, it's very effective, right? I had framed him as the kind of guy who was going to make character attacks instead of political, instead of political points. It actually took it off the table for him. I had framed him as that kind of person, so he couldn't do it anymore. In fact, the, the, the show there was actually two segments. I was on for two segments with him. He cut off the second segment about three minutes early because he was so frustrated. Um, the, between the two segments, he went to commercial. Um, and during the commercial, he actually wheeled out, he had one of his Oompa Loompas wheel out a, uh, a, a kid who'd, who'd been shot, right? He wheeled out some, some poor guy who'd been shot and was in a wheelchair. Um, and you could see that they were prepping the cameras to turn around and then you were going to get the view of the kid, and he was going to say to me, Ah, Shapira, why don't you make the points you're making to me, to this poor child? And he couldn't do it. And the reason that he couldn't do it is because I'd already exposed the tactic. Right? If he had done that, I immediately would have said to him, Piers, first you were standing on the graves of the children of Sandy Hook, and now you're standing on this fellow's wheelchair. That's really despicable. It's exploitative and it's despicable, which it is. It is exploitative and despicable. You have to characterize your opposition. Every debate is won or lost within the first 30 seconds of the debate. The minute that somebody characterizes their opposition successfully, the debate is over. You don't have to watch the rest of it. You can watch the first two minutes of any of the Romney-Obama debates and know who's winning immediately. Okay. Third point here. You have to frame the debate itself. The left likes to frame debate in its own terms. They always, they always have a set of terms, and they're not real terms, but they're buzzwords. Right? Tolerance, diversity. Uh, well, Piers, later in that interview on gun control, he tried to frame the debate as, do you really need an AR-15? Right? That, that, that's the, fr that the way he was framing the debate is, what are our needs? First of all, that's an un-American perspective. What are our needs? The question is, what are our rights? Right? What do you have a right to do? If we're going to live in a country where the government gets to take everything from you but what you need, now you're talking about Soviet Russia. If the government determines what you need and all you get is what you need, well, get rid of your iPhones, get rid of your cars, get rid of your air conditioning. You don't need any of those things. Right, but that's not what America is all about. So it's important that we frame the debate. That's why I pulled out the Constitution on him, because I wanted him to have to argue about gun control in the context of this is a country that has a Second Amendment. Now, 
do you like the Second Amendment or do you not like the Second Amendment? Now, he, he hates the Second Amendment, but he can't say that because it's America, right? And, he, and so he would have looked like – he would have looked terrible if he had said, I, I disagree with the fundamental premise of the Second Amendment, which is that you have a right to bear arms. He could not go there. The minute he would go there, he would lose. That's why I say – you hear me say to him, Piers, if you want to take away all the guns, let's talk about that. But he wouldn't go there. He actually refused to go there because he knew that the minute he says that, he loses the argument. The American people are not up for that. Fourth point here. Set up philosophical inconsistencies in your opponent's arguments. Now, this is a fun exercise we can do. You can pick any issue that the left likes to talk about, and there is a massive philosophical inconsistency. The left does not have philosophically coherent positions unless they are open Marxists. Open Marxism is actually a philosophically coherent position. Most of what the democratic left does, kind of the typical liberal left in, in Washington, D.C., those are not coherent positions. They don't make sense. There is a hole in them, even using their own logic. So we can do this. Pick, pick an issue. Somebody pick an issue. Anybody? An issue that comes up a lot. Abortion. Okay, abortion's an easy one, right? If you, look at, if you look at the left on abortion, the left has a series of, of philosophical inconsistencies with regard to abortion. First of all, they say that they are the pro-science left and we are the anti-science right, and yet they are the ones who wish to restrict the use of 4D ultrasounds because they don't want women to be able to see what exactly they are aborting. Right? It, when, if, uh, it, another obvious inconsistency in the left's position is that their argument is that we want to control women's bodies, which is false. We're not interested in controlling, for example, women's spleens. We're interested in controlling what it is inside that is not actually the woman, right? which is the separate being that is being created there. Uh, the left likes to claim that it's pro-child. It is absolutely not pro-child. When it is for the, the technical position of the Democratic Party is that one minute before that, that baby enters that birth canal, you should be able to kill it. Yeah, this is a philosophically inconsistent position. Nothing, people on the left will not even go this far. If you ask most people on the left who call themselves pro-choice, even they will say you shouldn't be able to abort a kid at six months, which means they've lost the argument. Because why should you be able to abort a kid at five months but not at six months? Every single position of the left has this, has this sort of inconsistency. On, on gun control, for example, their inconsistency is they say, oh, let's ban assault weapons but not handguns. That's an idiotic position. If I were a member of the left, I would think that's an idiotic position. Because the, really, it makes no sense. Because the fact is that so-called assault weapons are, were used in about 350 murders in 2011, and handguns were used in about 6,000 murders in 2011. So, by, statistically speaking, which one is more dangerous? There are about the same number of assault of, of rifles, long guns, in the United States as there are of handguns. About 110 million long guns. There are about 100 million handguns in the United States, and yet one has disproportionate numbers of murders committed with it. Why? Because it's easier to hold the handgun, and it's easier to transport it, or, and it's easier to get it into places where you can kill people. Um, but the left takes this position because it's easier to make Americans ban scary-looking guns. That's a philosophically inconsistent position. It's a stupid position. Eventually, I got Pierce to admit on the air that he would prefer to take all the guns. Uh, he, I actually did get him to admit that on the air, which was fun, because at that point, he had completely lost the American people. Um, point number five, don't get sidetracked. You may notice when you're discussing with folks on the left any political issue, they like to throw out red herrings. Uh, the red herring usually has a name, and that name is usually George W. Bush. No matter, no matter what you're discussing, somebody will eventually bring up, yeah, but what about Bush? And the proper response is not to start arguing about George W. Bush's policy. The proper response is, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, what about Woodrow Wilson? <laughs> like, neither of them have been president for quite a while at this point. Why don't we talk about the person who's in office or the policy that's happening right now? If you want to discuss the policies of, like, James K. Polk and we can discuss, you know, the, whether it was a good idea to invade Mexico or not, then we can do that too. <laughs> but this is, this is irrelevant. Um, the, the left likes to sidetrack conversations when they get stuck. You see it all the time. Uh, in this in particular interview, uh, Pierce had a particularly amusing way of doing this. We were discussing gun control, and again, he had his Oompa Loompas come out during the break, and, um, and they brought out a, uh, about six boxes of Sudafed. Um, and I'm from California, so I immediately thought we're cooking crystal meth. <laughs> Uh, we, in fact, were not cooking crystal meth. He was, he was going to try and make an inane political point. Um, so he, he puts the Sudafed on the table, and he, we come back from break, and he says to me, you know, Mr. Shapiro, I can walk down to the CVS, and I can't buy six boxes of Sudafed. I can't buy them all at once. It's against the law. But I can walk down to Walmart, and I can buy 1,000 rounds of ammunition all at once. Don't you find that inconsistent? And I said, I don't understand what one has to do with the other. Which is correct. I can have a position on Sudafed that's different from my position on bullets because they're not the same thing. I don't take bullets for a headache. I mean, this is... 
he was trying to set up this kind of red herring. Once I said that, he had to push the Sudafed off to the side, and he couldn't really – there was no argument to be made. Later, I tweeted at him, don't bring Sudafed to a constitution fight. <laughs> Sixth point here. If you don't know something, admit it right off the bat. Nobody in America knows everything. This is one of the great points of conservatism, actually, is that nobody knows everything. There is no one all-knowledgeable person. I know Barack Obama thinks he is. That one all-knowledgeable person who can control every aspect of your life and the economy. He can control everything that happens in the world and foreign policy because he knows everything. But the idea of administrative government, the idea that there is the set of wise bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., who know more than everybody about everything, even about a particular industry, it's just not true. Well, that's true for you personally, too. None of us know, none of us are God. We, know, we don't know everything. At some point in a debate, somebody will probably bring up something you don't know about. The proper answer to that is, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me research it and get back to you. That's an honest answer. What you see too many people doing is getting themselves in hot water, pretending to know things that they don't actually know about. It's a lesson I actually learned early in my career when I was interviewing for a job and uh, it, was, it was at um, a Jewish nonprofit, and uh, they had asked me about uh, a magazine that they, that they printed. I had never heard of this magazine. And they said, well, what, what are your criticisms of the magazine? And I said, well, this, the, the magazine is not academic enough. Turns out it was published by Haifa University and, was a, uh, and, and was, all the articles were written by top-notch professors. Uh, so that was a mistake. That, that, that's a mistake that I vowed not to repeat. Uh, you see people do this all the time in, mass, in major political debates. Actually, Mitt Romney did it on Benghazi. He clearly did not know what he was talking about. He had no expertise on the issue. When Candy Crowley you know, fought him on the point that he was making, he didn't know enough how to fight back at her. So he kind of froze up, as opposed to saying to her, Candy, I don't know if Obama sent you the, che if the checks in the mail or what, but you're absolutely wrong on this, and here's why you're wrong. He didn't know enough about the topic. So number one, don't bring up a topic you don't know that much about. And number two, if you don't know something, just say right off the bat you don't know about it. Now, this happened in this particular debate when Pierce took out a letter by, signed by Ronald Reagan from 1994 about assault weapons. And he said to me, you know, Mr. Shapiro, do you know what Ronald Reagan's position was on assault weapons? And I said, no, Pierce, I was four when he left office. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and, he sa and I said, why don't you read it to me? And so he, and so he, of course, he was going to anyway. And so he, re he starts reading the thing, and it appears on the screen. It's scrolling down, um, and it's talking about how assault weapons are the worst thing in the world. Now, later, I did some research, and what I found out is that Reagan's position on assault weapons was not talking about the same kind of assault weapons that Piers Morgan was talking about. Piers Morgan was talking about an AR-15, which is basically just a normal semi-automatic rifle. Ronald Reagan was talking about fully automatic machine guns at the time. I didn't know that. I had no clue. I'd never read this letter. Um, and this brings me to the um, which brings me to the seventh point here, which is finally he finishes reading this letter and he says, "Here's Ronald misrepresenting Reagan's position." But he finishes the letter and he says, "Here's Ronald Reagan's position on assault weapons. You like Ronald Reagan? Why don't you agree with?" He said, "You know, what do you think of that?" And I said, "So." And he didn't know what to say to that. He said, "Well, you like Ronald Reagan?" I said, "That's true. I do like Ronald Reagan. I don't think he was God. You know, people on our side do things that are wrong." You don't have to worship people who are on our side of the aisle. Don't get sucked into the paradigm is the point here. This is the seventh point. Don't get sucked in by the paradigm. Just because somebody is on our side doesn't mean that they're always right. And this is, I think, the biggest mistake that the conservative movement makes in general. It's why we back George W. Bush's horrendous moves on domestic policy repeatedly. It's why George W. Bush's second term was an absolute disaster. Face it, folks. I like George W. Bush. He was an honorable fellow. His second term was an absolute unmitigated disaster. Without Bush's second term, there is no Obama first term. It is basically that simple. But we sided with him because he was our dude. And we can't do that. We see it right now. There's a bunch of people on, on NSA surveillance, and they're saying, well, you know, Bush initiated it, and Bush was our dude. Mike Rogers is our dude on the House Intel Committee, so that means that we'll agree with him. Do your own research. Maybe you agree with him. Maybe you don't. But make sure that you agree with him before you just go by, it's Mike Rogers, therefore I agree, or it's Rand Paul, therefore I agree, or it's, or it's you know, Senator McCain, God forbid, therefore I agree. Um, don't get sucked in by the paradigm. Eighth point here. One of the fun things to do, this is a parlor trick you can use with your friends. It's like a little magic trick in arguments. Uh, and that is to let the other side have meaningless victories. The other side likes to operate within the context of buzzwords, you know, tolerance and diversity and acceptance and all these things that mean nothing to them because they don't tolerate you, they don't accept you, and they're not interested in diversity with you. But they like to use those words a lot. So it's okay for you to say, you know what, I'm also for tolerance, diversity, and acceptance. It makes you look moderate. It makes you look like you're not a wild-eyed right-winger. 
It makes you look like you're willing to come to some common ground. Uh, one of the examples of, of a way to do this is on the immigration side of, of things. You know, the, the left likes to talk a lot about a pathway to citizenship. You too are for a pathway to citizenship. The nice thing is the, the words pathway to citizenship don't mean anything. They can mean whatever you want them to mean. The pathway can citizenship, to, to citizenship can mean we deport you to Bolivia and you stay there for 45 years. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. The left likes to use buzzwords because buzzwords are popular, and you see this in the polling data. Right? Every time the left does this routine um, in polling, what they do is they say, are the American people for a pathway to citizenship? Which is like saying, are the American people for the color green? <laughs> it doesn't have... Define your terms, and then maybe we'll talk about what, like, what does that mean? Are we talking about a pathway to citizenship that means immediate legal status, and you get to stay in the country and we don't shut the border? Or are you talking about the people who are here have to go back to their original home countries? But you can win points with moderates by saying that you are for things that don't have any content to them. And this is an important thing to do. It's actually a very valuable thing to do. Because there's a difference between quarrelsome and smart. Uh, ninth point here is to ask questions. People on the left are not fond of, uh, of being on the defensive. They really don't like it very much at all. They're, they're very fond of being on the offensive, which is why you're sitting around with, with your friends and you've stated your position that you're an advocate of traditional marriage. And they immediately come at you, well, why do you hate gay people? Right? They like to be on the offensive, and usually they are offensive on the offensive. They, they, they like to constantly assault you. Well, it is your job to put them on the defensive. Explain to me why a child does not need a mother and a father. Right? Why, why doesn't a kid need a mom and a dad? And if you had to pick between mom and dad, which one would you pick? And would you prefer two dads or two moms? Is there any difference? Are, are men and women exactly the same? Right? You, you have to make them answer questions about their own philosophy. Now, maybe they've really thought it out, in which case, good. Maybe, you know, maybe they're even so brilliant they'll convince you. But they have to defend their own positions. And especially when you're, you know, in a TV situation or a radio situation with somebody on the other side, it is imperative that you ask them to defend their positions. They don't have positions, most of them. Most people on the left don't have positions. They have feelings. They have feelings about you, and they have feelings about policy, and they have all sorts of feelings, which is why they like to paint and write poetry, and we like to hire people. But this is... <laughs> But, it's, but we must, must, must force them to defend the positions that they purport to represent. Tenth point here is that body language actually matters. Um, you may notice that uh, in, in the beginning of that tape, as soon as I call Piers a bully, his hand kind of cramps up on the table. Um, you can see he's real pissed. I mean, you don't, he, I mean, he was pissed enough that when we, when we got to the break, I turned to him and I said, I'm having a lot of fun. This is really nice. Thank you. Uh, and he looked at me like he was going to bite off my arm. Um, and... Uh, and unfortunately, you can see most Republicans don't pay attention to this. The best example of this body language imagistics, this stuff absolutely matters. I mean, I'm, I'm from Hollywood. Both my parents work in Hollywood. Um, and imagistic, what people look like, matters a tremendous amount. It didn't matter what John McCain said during the 2008 election. It really did not. That election was over the minute you put John McCain on a stage with Barack Obama. The election was over. And it was even more over when you put them in a debate together and you had John McCain gripping his microphone like he wanted to throttle the neck of it, right? You could see his, the whites of his knuckles, right? He, like all the blood rushed out of his hands. And at that point, you figured, okay, he's probably losing the debate. Even though if you listen to it, he's probably winning the debate. The truth is that he was losing the debate automatically. And, and when it comes to imagistics, the Republican Party just sucks. We, we were terrible at it, really, truly terrible at it. Back in 2008... You had Barack Obama descending from the clouds, Lenny Reifenstahl style, onto the stage of a massive Greek pantheon with columns in the background and the angels singing. And, uh, and then he came out and gave a speech in front of 60,000 people. And then you had John McCain whimpering into a microphone with a literal green screen, not like with something projected behind him, but a lime green screen behind him as though he was about to film an action sequence for Gollum from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and he's standing there talking about what a great president Barack Obama would be if he actually gets elected. It's over, right? It's over. Imagistics matter. So body language matters. So you may notice that, for example, my haircut's different. I learned this after this interview, that body language matters. Uh, you know, it, to, to change the haircut, change the wardrobe a little bit. There, people in Hollywood do this all the time. It's why when ben, A ben Affleck goes out for a coffee and you see him being, you know, they take a picture of Ben Affleck, uh, he always looks good. The reason is because he gets ready and he goes out to look good. And when you see Republican politicians, I mean, when you saw Mitt Romney the week after he had, he had lost the election, he looked like a homeless person at a, at a, at a gas station. Literally, I mean, he was wearing like a white tracksuit at a, at a gas station down in Marina del Rey. 
this guy is worth like hundreds of millions of dollars, and he looks like he just fell out of bed that morning, which he probably did, and, uh, and you know, made his way over to the gas station specifically so that the paparazzi could take pictures of him and make him look like a doof. Uh, and it's the same thing with, with most Republican politicians. It's the same thing with you guys. They're going to want you to look like the typical Republican politician, right? They're going to – blue shirt, red tie, blue blazer, comb over. Right. This is this is why, uh, preferably, you know, preferably you wear some thick glasses if you can find them. Um, th th this is why everybody on MSNBC looks the same. Right. Fox News is the one thing that the, the right has done correctly. Right. Everybody on Fox News is very attractive. That actually matters. It's why they have good ratings. MSNBC cultivates a different look, which is like the hippie in the basement look, typing on their computer. Right. Like the, the three day stubble, and they all have the same pair of glasses that they've been handing around since Keith Olbermann was on the air. <laughs> But imagistics, how you define yourself in image matters. Most people make a snap decision about whether they like you or not. Within, within literally one second of them seeing you, science shows that they are going to determine whether they like you or not. It's true in dating, it's true in friendship, it's true in life, and it's true in politics. So it's very important that our body language be good, and when we look angry, when we look upset, when we look old, when we look mean, it makes it too easy for folks on the other side. And that doesn't mean that you have to pander by, you know, making the asinine assumption that if you throw a couple black candidates up on stage, black people are going to vote for you, or if you put, throw a couple Hispanics on stage, Hispanics will suddenly see the light. That's not how it works. But you have to present yourself as young and fresh thinking, and you should have fresh thoughts. I mean, because this is, in the end, what really distinguishes us from the left, what distinguishes right from left, is that while the left calls themselves progressive, the left is not progressive. The left is stagnation. The left wants to redistribute what currently exists. The left's goal is for everybody to have an iPhone 5. Preferably, if you have two, you give one to somebody else. The right's goal is for us to get to iPhone 12. Right? The right's goal is for us to actually achieve things technologically. The fact is that poor people in this country live better than rich people did 80 years ago. That's not true in most countries in the world. Most countries in the world are living the same way they did 500 years ago. And they're re if you think they're not redistributing wealth, they are. They're redistributing wealth. It's just not creating anything. This is the difference between us and the left. Now, this means a reorientation for folks on the right. People on the right like to talk a lot about the past. We're very fond of the past. We like the Constitution for good reason. We like founding philosophy for good reason. We like Lincoln and we like Reagan. We like a lot of things in the past for good reason. The problem is it is very, very, very easy to caricature the past because the past is defined. Right, whenever we say that we like certain things about the 1950s, like, for example, the booming economy and a much better level of family values, the left immediately comes back with, well, segregation and women are not in the workplace, right? Because the past is already defined. Whereas if you're Barack Obama, you don't talk about the past ever. The past is a bad thing. The future is a good thing. Now, the problem for Obama is that he doesn't actually say what the future is going to be like. He just tells you he's going to change things and that he's going to take you to the future, which doesn't mean anything, but it sounds great, right? I'm going to change everything, and then we're going to be in the future. Well, well guess what, gang? Right now... What I say in two seconds will be the future. The future. Right? We're there. What a magical world. We are presenting a vision of the future that's different, a vision of the future in which human freedom makes lives better and makes people's lives better. But in order to get there, we have to label the left for who they are. They are interested in making you the bad guys in this morality play. I started off by saying every political discussion is a morality play. This is a morality play. There's one side that wants to stagnate. There's one side that wants to keep inner city children in poverty and degradation in bad schools because they want to pay off their teacher union buddies. There's one side that wants to make sure that you can't drive the car that you want because it might kill a dolphin one day 40 years from now. There's one side of the political aisle that says you need the permission of somebody in Zimbabwe in order to raise your thermostat two degrees. Right? There's one side of the political aisle that says it doesn't matter if a woman decides to kill her baby because it's two minutes before it came through her vagina. Okay, this is insanity. This is, and, and I understand Ronald Reagan said a lot of very wise things. One thing that, that he said that was not particularly wise is he said that some folks who are on the other side of the aisle, we don't think that they're bad people, they're just misguided. At a certain point, when you get three generations down the line into impoverishment, into misery, into the spread of human misery and the spread of violence, at some point ignorance becomes sin. Don't be afraid to label bad policies what they are, and don't be afraid to label what the other side is doing for what they are doing because they're sure as hell going to label you. There's only one way to fight a bully, and that's to punch him back twice as hard. Thanks so much.
we're going to do Q&A. Um, two of my colleagues will come around with mics and just um, make sure you say your name and school um, and then ask your question. In the meantime, I'll sing. No, I'll sing. <laughs> That everybody's so polite, you know there's a conservative gathering. Um, Eric Lennon, I graduated from Hampton West High School at UCSB in the fall. Um, this is a question I've been holding on to for a while. It seems, obviously, after the defeat of 2012, obviously, yeah, people are saying the party is in trouble. And 2016 is looking to be even worse because, obviously, the, shouldn't say elephant in the room, I guess technically donkey in the room, that being Hillary Clinton. The elephant was correct. <laughs> Um, obviously, she's looking to be just a powerhouse. Even with Benghazi and all that, many people are saying she's unstoppable. So, in your opinion, who do you think would be the ideal Republican candidate who would have a chance of beating Hillary Clinton? You know, it's a little early, obviously, but um, I'll tell you, there's there, there are people who, who stand on principle, which is, which is something that I like. Um, I know Senator Paul. I know uh, Senator Rubio a little bit. I know uh, Senator Cruz relatively well. Um, all three of those guys are very interesting candidates. What I, what I will say is that Senator Paul has tremendous political instincts. He has very, very, very good political instincts, and he also sort of reshifts. I don't agree with him on foreign policy virtually at all, but Senator Paul uh, is, is reshifting the debate in certain ways to appeal to young people. Right? His position on marijuana is very appealing to a lot of young folks. Um, he's much more libertarian, in ter- not in terms of abortion, but in, he's, he's a state's rights guy in terms of, uh, in terms of marriage. Um, he also is somebody who doesn't speak like a typical Republican, which is, which is a big thing. Um, I think that Ted is a very talented guy. He's a very, very, very smart guy. Um, he needs to recast himself a little bit and bring something new to the table because everything that we talk about on – what I like about Ted is that Ted does a very good job of casting the other side for what they are. Right? Ted calls out the other side very, very often, and he's correct. He's eminently correct. Um, what Ted needs to do is he needs to get away from the vision of the Tea Party that the media has created is an old white person standing in a park wearing a Thomas Jefferson wig. Um, and as far as we can disassociate from that as possible, while keeping the founding ideals will be, will be a good thing. I said imagistics matters. It does. Um, I don't think Hillary is unbeatable, but I think that there's two steps to defeating Hillary. The first is to just completely destroy the mainstream media. It has to be destroyed. We're not going to win elections until the mainstream media is completely destroyed. The mainstream media, Andrew Breitbart, who was my mentor and I knew him for 10 years, Andrew always used to say that the media was the fight and the media is the fight. The fact is that Hillary Clinton was a horrendous Secretary of State. She was not a mediocre Secretary of State. She was a brutally horrible Secretary of State. The fact is that Hillary Clinton bears responsibility for what happened in Benghazi under the law, under the, under the Secretary of State's website, it says she's responsible for the security of embassy personnel. Um, the fact that she's been allowed to get away with it is a testament to the power of the media. Um, so we're going to have to destroy the media, no matter who their candidate is. I mean, they could literally run Joe Biden and, and still get 40. Remember, they could run Joe Biden and get 47% of the vote, 48% of the vote. Right? Not because of the 47% or any of the nonsense Mitt Romney was talking about, um, but because there is a, a high level of there's a high level of belief in the Democratic Party thanks to the media. So we're going to have to destroy the media, number one. And number two, we can't be afraid to attack Hillary for who she is. Everybody wants to be cordial with Hillary. It, it made me sick. When she was stepping down and you saw Republicans on the Senate floor talking about how wonderful she'd been, the hell she had. There's not a single country on the face of the earth that is freer now than when Barack Obama took office. Not one. And, and the entire Middle East has now descended into a Muslim Brotherhood pit. So... Um, you know, we're going to have to go after her in pretty harsh terms. This is what the left does to us. I mean, Mitt Romney had been defined as a rich, white, horrible guy. I mean, Mitt Romney was maybe the most honorable man ever to run for president, by the way. I mean, forget his policies. Forget whether he was a good candidate. In terms of pure personal honorableness, Mitt Romney was, was at the top of the list. He was as clean a candidate as you're ever going to find. They were able to demonize him anyway. So we're, we can't be afraid to do the same thing, especially when the person who's running is actually a demon with the Wicked Witch of the West music playing in the background every time she walks on stage. <laughs> How did it feel to find out that Captain America dislikes you? Oh, yeah, that was um, – after I debated Piers Morgan a, a second, he had me back on about a month and a half ago. And the guy who plays uh, Captain America, Chris Evans, tweeted out that he genuinely disliked me, um, to which I responded, I don't dislike you. I mean, I, I think we can all agree that Fantastic Four was a terrible movie and still like each other. <laughs> It was a horrible movie. 
I, I didn't really want to get brutal and talk about how the first Captain America was boring as sin. Um, but uh, how did it feel? Well, you're doing something right. When, when mindless actors who read other people's lines dislike you, then you're probably doing something right. Hi, I'm um, Stefan Saku from Renaissance High School for the Arts in downtown Long Beach. Um, I was wondering, if you could reset every seat in the office, like replace everyone, what kind of people would you put in the office? And I don't mean like Republican or liberal, but like what kind of people would you want? What kind of people do you think would help this country? The state well, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not going to give the vague answer, you know, people who are driven, people who are, people who, uh, you know, have, uh, have ambition. I, I don't think that's true. I think people who don't, actually people who don't want to be there. I think that would actually be the first requirement would be people who don't want to be there. <laughs> this is why our politics is broken because everybody who's there desperately wanted to be there. It, it should be a group of people who this was actually, they were forced into doing it because they felt the need to be there. Um, and they would prefer to fix everything in two years and get out. Right? I mean, that, that would be the first requirement. Now, beyond that, somebody who had some sort of business experience would be nice that they know how the economy works. Uh, somebody who was well-read in history would be nice so that they know about how, how that works. Uh, somebody with children so they care about the future. I think there are a lot of folks in Congress who just don't care about the future. I mean, they, they live by the John Maynard Keynes line, right? The, the, the old John Maynard Keynes line was, was uh, you know, that in the long run we're all dead, which is the destruction of, of civilization. I mean, that's that, that perspective, that in the long run we're all dead. It's true. In the long run, we are all dead, so why not just impoverish the future in order to serve ourselves in the present? Uh, that, that's the death of Western civilization. So, um, But first and foremost, people who don't want to be in politics would prefer to be home with their families, making a life for themselves, and were forced into it because the country is in such dire shape. Hi, I'm Rachel Yvonne from St. Joseph High School in Lakewood, California. And you said that the media needs to be destroyed, and although my government book says that the media is Tell me how much you think it is, and how would you go about fixing it? The media is worth at least 10 points to Democrats in every four-year election, and probably worth eight points to Democrats in every off-year election. That's how, that's how biased they are. Uh, the media is completely staffed. It's the same people I went to law school with. I mean, people who go to law school at Harvard Law School, they are, they are very, very, very much to the left. They don't think of themselves as, as to the left. This is one of the great things about being a leftist. You don't think that you have an opinion. You think you have a fact. Right? It's just like your, your textbook thinks it has a fact, not an opinion. The media is not biased. Right? That's an opinion. Um, the folks in the media don't understand. They live in a milieu in which everybody who surrounds them thinks exactly like they do. It's just like the university system. And so they've never heard anything different. And, and when they do consider something different, it's, it's foreign and odd. Um, the media is, is made up completely of people who feel the necessity to be on the, the side of, of what they perceive to be fairness. Uh, that's actually the top priority for most people in the media. They want to they stand up for the little guy. And the little guy is always, is always not the Republican in their definition, even if government is enormous. Um, so, you know, the, the, when I say the media has to be destroyed, the good news is the media is currently under the, under, underway. I mean, it is being destroyed. Well, the, the new technology is killing the New York Times. It's destroying CNN. It's destroying MSNBC. It's just, all, all of the bastions of the old media are going down in flames. The LA Times might be bought by the Koch brothers. I mean, this is, this is what is going on with the old media, which is wonderful. Thank God for that. But it's going to take a while. And I, I said after, after, you know, 2010, and we, the Tea Party, you know, won in a vast number of seats in Congress, people were declaring, this is the end of the old media. And I remember saying to folks, oh, you haven't seen them start yet. You have not seen them start yet. I mean, remember, in 2008, they didn't just pick the Democrat nominee and the president of the United States. They picked the Republican nominee in 2008. And okay, the mainstream media built John McCain. The mainstream media, I mean, truly, they actually built Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney was the most moderate candidate in the field. So the mainstream media has an enormous amount of power, um, and they will continue to wield an enormous amount of power, but they can only wield it. This is the nice thing. They can only wield it if we let them wield it, whether it's through boycotts, which in the LA Times has fallen off largely because of, of, of boycotts. Um, but you know, beyond that, if we can take out the media by not allowing them to hide behind the facade of objectivity. I'm telling you, when I did that to Piers, Eric Wemple of the Washington Post, who is a leftist, was ripping Piers, ripping him. Because it was humiliating to them. It was, it Pierce, it Pierce said during the show, there was one point during that, during that segment in which Pierce said, well, I'm not a leftist. I said, that's a lie. Of course you're a leftist. And he, uh, and, and he didn't have a comeback to that because, of course, he is a leftist. If one person got on with George Stephanopoulos and started off by saying to George Stephanopoulos, George, thank you so much for having me on the program. I appreciate the access to your audience. Before we start, let's get one thing straight. 
I'm a conservative, you're a liberal. You were in the Clinton war room and you used the Obama talking points in order to push a liberal agenda. George Stephanopoulos would be finished. There's nothing, there's no comeback to that. What's he going to claim, that he's objective when he was in the Clinton war room? It's like claiming that Karl Rove would be objective. Right? It really is. It's the direct equivalent. He was the Karl Rove of the Clinton administration. So, you know, the, the only thing that allows the media to get away with it is people like John McCain and like Lindsey Graham and like all of these people who take advantage of the collective action problem to get on TV and get exposure because no other Republican will go on. And you do see that. People won't go on because they say, well, why would I go on with George Stephanopoulos? He's just going to shellac me. So he would much prefer to have on John McCain, who's going to treat him like he's a normal questioner. So they can't do it without our permission, um, and uh, we don't have to give our permission. Hi, I'm Jacob Chalkovich. I go to West Ranch High School. Uh, where do you recommend we get our information from if we can't trust the media? Well, uh, um, not to plug my own website here, uh, or our own website. Breitbart.com is a good place to go. Um, but, um, you know, Drudge does a very good job of collating the news. Uh, there's a... Uh, you know, I, I think that multiple sources of information are good. I, I don't think that you have to completely cease reading CNN.com, but I would recommend that that not be your only source for information. I always, actually, what I always say when I speak especially to conservative high school students is if you have a choice between going to a conservative college and going to a liberal college, if you know that you're a conservative and you, you really have your values set, go to a liberal college. You'll learn more. You'll go there and you'll learn how they think. And then you'll go home and you'll read about it, and you'll really get good at this. I mean, the way that I became good at arguing these sorts of things is because I spent lots of time arguing these sorts of things at UCLA and Harvard. The same thing is true of the media. You should know what they're saying. I read the Huffington Post every morning, egregious as it is. I read the Huffington Post every morning. You know, I read the New York Times, and, and we, should. we should. We should read all of their sources because they're surely not reading ours, so that gives us an advantage. Hi, I'm J.R. Ridley. I'm one of the uh, interns here at Young Americans Foundation this summer. And I'm wondering, as a conservative Jew in the community, what are some of the biggest challenges you face not being part of the Christian right as it's kind of, uh, as a term's kind of coined by the media? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the, the truth is that, um, I, I think that's a variation of the question, why are Jews liberal? But um, the, the, the truth is that in terms of uh, you know, not being part of the Christian right, I mean, that's never been a, a hardship for me. I mean, the Christian right has always been very kind to me. Um, and uh, they've always been kind to Dennis Prager, and they've always been kind to Michael Medved, and they've always been kind to you know a huge number of, of Jews in the movement. Um, this is the the truth is that it is the uh, it is the liberal Jewish community that is much more intolerant of both Orthodox Jews and conservative Jews uh, than the conservative right. Uh, one of the one of the great lies of, of modern politics is that it's the right that's anti-Semitic. It's not. It's the left. There's way more anti-Semitism on the left than the, than there is on the right. Uh, the, the le that's why the left is anti-Israel. It's why Barack Obama is very anti-Israel. Uh, the reason that so many Jews vote liberal is because most Jews don't practice Judaism. I mean, there's two types of Judaism. There's ethnic Judaism, like you're born Jewish, which is true. If your mom is Jewish, you're born Jewish. Um, and then there's practicing Judaism, the set of, of values and standards that actually is expressed in the Torah and the, and the you know, Mishnah, the, the oral Torah, uh, that, was, that was given at Mount Sinai. That, that standard is not a liberal standard, and this is why Orthodox Jews vote by huge percentages Republican. You know, my synagogue is probably 75-25 probably maybe higher, maybe 80-20 Republican. That's true for most of the Orthodox community. But most Jews are not, most Jews call themselves Jews in public so that they don't have to be identified as white people because white people are bad, right? Most Jews who are, especially Jews who are living in Hollywood, they want to be part of a minority because you get special status for being part of a minority and, uh, and because it's culturally cool to like bagels and locks and matzo ball soup. But they, they have less relationship to Judaism than most conservative Christians do is the truth. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the truth is that if you look at the history of the media, the, media, the, the, the landscape of the media really began to shape during, during – of the modern media began to shape during FDR. Before FDR, there were really partisan papers on both sides. For example, the Chicago Tribune, which is now a vastly left paper. The Chicago Tribune was owned by a guy named Robert McCormick, and, uh, and Robert McCormick was a right-winger. Robert McCormick, when, when they did the uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 32, his headline was Reds Meet in Chicago. Right, so the, the, there was a time when the media was more evenly – if you go back to the founding, there was no such thing as an objective journalist. There were just you know, people slinging mud at each other. I prefer that. That's more honest. 
Like at Breitbart, we, we don't make any pretense about the fact that we're conservative. CNN lies about the fact that they're liberal. Um, the, the, constitu- the, the constituency of the mainstream media really began to change during FDR when the, when the administration worked very much hand in glove with most of the major media moguls in order to push a certain agenda. I mean, uh, FDR was about as close as we've come, well, except for maybe Woodrow Wilson, he's about as close as we've come to legitimate fascism as we've had in the United States. Uh, which is not to say that he's a fascist or even supremely close to a fascist, but if you look at how fascist economics worked, he was applying them, you know, the kind of corporatist policy. And if you look at his relations with the media, uh, they were very top-down. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, it, w- it was FDR who interned 100,000 Japanese people. So it's, it, it, that's, that's about as close as we've come in the United States to top-down control. We're still living in, that, in, in the vestiges of that. Right. Edward R. Murrow was a leftist, but everybody considers him a wonderful journalist. Walter Cronkite was a, was a wild leftist, but everybody considers him uh, an objective journalist. I remember I, I did a I was at the, the RNC this year, and Sam Donaldson was hanging around. Sam Donaldson used to be the guy who bugged Re- Ronald Reagan a lot, uh, and Sam Donaldson portrayed himself as an objective journalist. Now he does an opinion shtick on uh, on ABC Radio, and I went up to him in his eyebrows and I said to him, Sam. Um, <laughs> And now you do this opinion stuff. These are the same opinions that you held, presumably, when you were reporting for ABC News so many years ago. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, why did you lie and call yourself an objective journalist? And he said, you think you're better than me? I said, well, yeah, because I'm not a liar. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's been the way that the media has been able to get away with it, is that nobody says that to them. Not to their face. In fact, the only person who did say that to their face was Newt Gingrich during the debates, and that was his best moment. Right? Newt, Newt has more skeletons in his closet than the entire cast of Pirates of the Caribbean. But what, but what Newt did better than anybody is he took on the mainstream media when they were asking stupid questions. I mean, it was like Greg Popovich dealing with the press. He, he, he was not willing to accept the premise of their stupid questions. Ron Phillips again. What do you consider one of the most um, latent and repulsive um, liberal twistings of the news that have happened recently? Oh, boy. Well, what day is it? <laughs> um, well, on immigration, it was very obvious what was going to happen immediately. I mean, I called this back in January. Once, guys, once you know that the left is looking to demonize and not actually and not actually form a policy that's good for Americans, it's very obvious to predict what they're doing. Right? Well, on immigration, they're going to demonize. So what does that mean? What does Barack Obama actually want? He's got a win-win. If he gets his immigration reform bill passed, and he has been behind it according to reports from Politico, if, if he gets his immigration bill passed, he gets 11 million new voters. If he doesn't get his immigration bill passed, then he gets to point at Republicans and call them mean and nasty. And Republicans are just stupid enough that they went along with this plan. Right? That's a twisting of the news. Sequestration was a wonderful twisting of the news. When Barack Obama flanked himself with the village people behind him and said every member of the village people, the firefighters and the, and the teachers and the first responders and the construction workers and the American Indian, they were all going to be fired if, they, you know, if sequestration went forward. On gun control, when President Obama flanked himself with a bunch of seven-year-olds, and acted as though we all want those seven-year-olds to get shot in the head if we don't agree with him on, on gun control, which is exactly what he's doing. That's the reason he has them there. It's the reason he has pathetic little White House videos of seven-year-olds reading letters to the president. You know, if, if we're going to have seven-year-olds define our policy, then I assure you public education will not last long. It's uh, – the, the, the manipulation of the news is absolutely constant. It's very difficult to figure out – one area in which uh, in which it's, it's worse than any other. I think that probably the worst the worst of the worst is what they've done on gay marriage, portraying people who are religious as anti-gay as opposed to just preservers of traditional marriage is probably the worst perversion because it's 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 slanderous. It really is. You don't have to you don't have to be a bigot to think that a child deserves a mother and a father, and that a and that the the final cap on the destruction of traditional marriage in this country, which is what gay marriage is, that that is that is destined to create. A, another, because another, it really is not the first, another generation of children who don't grow up in the, hou- in, in the sort of household that is best positioned to make children flourish. That doesn't mean that gay parents can't bring up kids well. It just means that a kid needs a mom and a dad. And that if you have an ideal, the ideal should be a mom and a dad. Uh, and that is, not a, uh, that is not an intolerant, bigoted position. It's actually intolerant, bigoted to pretend that men and women are exactly the same and that men and women can give exactly the same thing to children. My name is Erin Rachali. I'm from Mayfield Senior School in Pasadena, California. And I was wondering um, how you suggest arguing with teachers who um, discredit organizations like Fox News and, you know, like deem them unreliable. Well, I mean, the question in any conversation, the question is the goal. Uh, you're not going to convince the teacher. So I assume that you're talking about the teacher says something in class. 
So the next question is, are, is your name on the test? Those teachers will retaliate. If they're going to retaliate, don't bother to talk to kids outside of class. Um, if you have an anonymous test in your class and you can take your name off of it, like, like in college, you'll have blue books, right, which is what saved me. Um, if you, my, my, my blue books were indistinguishable from members of the Spartacus Club. Um, if you, uh, if, if you're going to talk to folks like that, I mean, the first question is always, um, please name the daytime lineup on Fox News, which they can't because they've never seen Fox News. The same way that when they say Rush Limbaugh's a bigot, you say, okay, what time in the morning is he on? They don't know, right, because they've never listened to Rush Limbaugh. In order for them to have any credibility on this issue, they should know what they're talking about. Uh, as far as, you know, Fox News, the, the other thing you can say about Fox News is, is very obvious. Look, Fox News is conservative. Well, MSNBC is liberal, so what? Like, does that mean, tell me what exactly, give me an example of them lying to the American people. Give me an example of where they lied. And then you can talk about specific examples because a broad charge like that is worthless. You have to force the left to define terms. They hate defining terms. They hate evidence and they hate having to define terms. Two, two bugaboos for them. You ask them either one of those things and they will collapse like a house of cards. You can try it. Try it one time. You'll see. You just ask them example. Evidence would be a good one. I remember I was having a conversation about gun laws, about background checks. And I said, look, the concept of background checks is very nice. If we could weed out everybody with guns who is bad guy... That would be great. I'm for it. Concept of background checks, I'm for. I actually said that in the interview. Concept of background checks, I'm for. Statistics show background checks do nothing. California has background checks, universal background checks. They don't do anything to diminish crime. So I prefer laws that actually are based on evidence of, of laws working. And I, I do this radio show in L.A. from 6 to 9 in the morning, um, which means I'm already tired. Um, and uh, the uh, – and. Uh, my, I do it with a, with a liberal guy. And I remember I said this to this guy. I said this to, uh, to Brian Whitman. Um, and I said, you know, Brian, I would prefer that laws be based on evidence. And he said, why? <laughs> and I said, because laws that are not based on evidence don't work. And he said, well, how do you know? And this is how, and this is how liberals think. Liberals think in the best of all possible worlds – you know, here's how everything would work out. Well, ideas are nice in theory, but unless you have some evidence to back it up, you know, sit down and shut up. Hello, uh, my name is Constantino, and I just graduated high school a week ago, and I'm going to attend every university in the fall. And uh, in our English class, we were shown an extremely feminist video explaining the Fox News as one of the main news sources that displays anti-feminist views. Right, because all the women are attractive. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, pretty much. So what are your thoughts on, I guess, feminism in general and everything like that? Well, I mean, feminism, the original point of feminism was a good point, which was a lot of men acted like pigs. Right? I mean, that, that's true. The problem is the solution of feminism was, okay, let's have women act, act like pigs also, as, a, as opposed to let's, have, let's hold men to a higher standard which is really what should have happened. They destroyed the very institutions that benefit women the most. The institu You know who's benefited from feminism the most is men. Men have been benefited enormously. We have to work less. You know, our, uh, Listen, if, if I can get a – my wife is in medical school at UCLA. I promise you I'm going to take a sabbatical the minute she starts working. You know, the, the feminism – women in the workplace is a wonderful thing. My mom was a, was a working woman. Uh, she actually, My dad was actually home with the kids. Um, feminism was very good about getting women into the workplace. What feminism was very bad about was the idea you have to destroy all traditional values in order to get women into the workplace. That's a lie. It's not true at all. The, the greatest institution in the history of mankind for women is monogamous marriage. It is the greatest institution in the history of mankind. Before that, women were just a member, they were members of harems and they were victims of sexism on a routine basis. Marriage, the, I mean, anybody who's married, you guys aren't married yet. Marriage is, is a, is about equality. That's what a marriage is about. It's not about the, the, the feminists have this idea of marriage that it's a patriarchal institution in which the man bosses the wife around. If that's the case, my wife certainly hasn't heard about it. <laughs> so, you know, the, feminism, feminism has made a lot of mistakes, among them the idea that um, – of separating marriage from sexuality and the idea that women should act exactly like men, that men and women are exactly the same. That's unnecessary. Men and women can have equal rights without being exactly the same. But the, the sex in the city version of femininity is, is really – quite repulsive and has led many young women to damage their lives because they buy into the idea that they can have sex with as many people as, as you know, promiscuous men would and, it would and it will have no impact on them. Men and women, and men and women are very different. They treat sex very differently. I mean, for, for men, there's only one question. Well, there, there are two questions, when and where, right? And women actually, and, and women generally like to ask the question who, 
Well, se- sex, sex in the City says that women should not even bother asking the question who. They should just treat it like men treat it. And that's, that's devastating because men and women are not built the same. They don't treat sex the same. They don't treat relationships the same. Women, civilized men. That's what women do. It's one of the things women do. And men are supposed to provide for women. That doesn't mean that women can't provide also. They should provide also. It's great. I, I, I've insisted to my wife, I, I promise you, right now she's studying for boars. And every other day I'm hearing about how she wants to quit med school. And I, and I tell her, you know, God forbid something should happen to me. I want to make sure that you can provide for yourself. I think it's very important that women get an education and, and, you, know, edu- and, and you know, be able to are independent. I think women's independence is a phenomenal thing. That was the good news about feminism. The bad news about feminism is that they felt they had to destroy the superstructure on which all of Western civilization is built in order to get women into the workplace. Last question. Hey, um, Kaylee Evans. I'm from Pensacola Heritage High School in Texas. <laughs> um, how do you combat an argument for home, or with homosexuals who don't want to have children? I'm sorry. So what's their, what's their argument? Oh, they, what do they say that they, they don't want to have? Oh, I, I understand. The homosexual couple doesn't want to have kids. Um, I've actually taken the position on, on gay marriage that the government should get out of the business of marriage completely. The reason that I've taken this position is not because I don't believe in traditional marriage. It's actually because I do believe in traditional marriage, and I live in the state of California, and I see what the left is doing. The original purpose – you have to go back to the original purpose of, of why the government was involved in marriage. The original reason the government was involved in marriage was to promote traditional marriage. That was a failure. Okay, we now have 75% of kids in the black community being born out of wedlock. We're, we are getting to the point where pretty soon a majority of kids, period, will be born out of wedlock because it's been escalating tremendously in the white community as well. Um, and, you know, the, the, the institution of government-sponsored marriage has basically failed. Nobody, nobody I know gets married because they're doing it for the tax benefits. In fact, you get hit worse on taxes if you're married. If you're married. There's a marriage penalty. Um, what the left is doing now with same-sex marriage, is not about two dudes living together or two ladies living together and living the life that they want to, or even having contractual relationships that allow them to do exactly what they want. We have civil unions in California. You can make a contract. I can make a contract with anybody in this room to visit me on my deathbed, although I doubt you'd want to do that. Um, you, know, they, the, you can do any of that stuff. There's nothing preventing that. What the same-sex marriage agenda is about is disestablishing any sort of religion in the country. That is really what is at the root of this. And the proof is in the pudding. California state legislature right now is going to use same-sex marriage as a lever in order to take away nonprofit status from every religious youth group in, in the state. There's a bill working its way through the California legislature right now that would remove nonprofit status from any youth organization that discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation or religion or even gender. So if I if you know my synagogue decides that it doesn't want an evangelical Christian coming in and proselytizing we can have our nonprofit status revoked, and vice versa. If your church decides they don't want an Orthodox Jew and they're talking about Jesus, you can have your nonprofit status revoked. That is the goal here. The left's goal here is not tolerance. It's not acceptance. The left's goal here is destruction of traditional, not, of traditional social institutions. That's the reason why gay marriage matters. Now, the reason I say that we ought to disestablish it is because once gay marriage is established in the state of California, and gang, it's coming. Whether it comes to referendum or whether it comes by a Supreme Court decision, we're going to come pretty quickly to the point in this country where the government is signing off on gay marriages and elevating them to the same level as heterosexual marriages. The next step is exactly what I'm talking about, revoking nonprofit status for churches that refuse to provide gay marriages, revoking nonprofit status for Catholic charities that refuse to allow gay couples to adopt. That already happened in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, the Catholic Church no longer handles adoptions because the Catholic Church was not willing, according to its moral scruples, to hand over a kid to a non-married heterosexual couple. And, uh, and, that's, and so they've had to get out of the business because they were, their nonprofit status was going to be revoked. Did that serve any of the kids? Absolutely not. So this is, why the, this is why the issue matters. And I feel horrible for people who are caught up in the situation where you know, they're gay and they feel like they can't get married and they feel discriminated against. But this is not a privacy issue. Remember we talked about spotting philosophical inconsistencies? This is not a privacy issue. The whole premise of gay marriage is that what I do – well, really, the whole premise of the homosexual rights movement is what I do behind closed doors shouldn't matter to you. And we all sort of agree with that, right? Instinctively, we all agree. What I do behind – how is it behind closed doors when the state's approving of what you do? Now we're talking public policy. It's actually a very dangerous position for the gay community to take because now it does matter what I think of, of you. The beauty of America is you can do what you want behind closed doors as long as you're not hurting anyone else. You know, you don't have to care what I think. I can think what you're doing is sinful and wrong and stupid and all those things. You don't have to care. But once you start forcing me to care because you're coming after my synagogue, 
then I'm going to start caring. And that's a very dangerous position. It's not good for, for, honestly, it's not good for gay rights activists because when the backlash comes, it's going to be pretty strong and it may be stronger than they're expecting. And uh, that will not be good for a lot of gay folks in this country.